Welcome to our video on daylighting, focusing on coordinating and integrating the building structure, the daylighting apertures, and the duct work with a particular focus on how that works in roofing systems. This is the uh, National Building Museum uh, in Washington, D.C. Uh, it has a very nice orientation. This would be the south wall. There is a north wall, which also is heavily glazed. And in this case, the south wall and the north wall are more expansive than the east and west walls, which is favorable from a thermal point of view. Although from a psychological point of view, they've included glass in the east and west walls to enhance the amount of daylighting and just generally make the spaces seem more cheerful. This is what the building looks like on the inside. It's a rather bizarre combination of architectural styles. These are probably the world's largest Greek columns. Over here we see some Roman arches. And then in the roof we see what for that time was basically space age structural technology and buildings. Uh, this was constructed, I think, shortly after the Civil War. And these roof trusses are basically um, steel uh, composite materials and steel rod. High strength steel, one of the first building applications of it. And you'll notice the structure here is all down below the roof and below the roof apertures. The key thing is these roof apertures represent some special local loads so they've arrived at the nodes on the trusses. What you'd like to avoid is having these special roof loads occur somewhere in between the nodes. So here we have a node and another node and another node in this structure. In this case, all this truss work, the lower portions are represented as tensile members or rods. And the reason that can happen is because this roof has been heavily ba ballasted with uh, concrete planks. Those concrete planks are heavy enough that the wind suction on the roof never under overcomes that gravity load. And so all these tension members that are in tension under gravity remain in tension even when there's wind suction applicable, which allows it to have this really super lightweight and beautifully expressive quality. Uh, and the space is so dramatic. Uh, I took my son there when he was just a child and he looked up at this space and he said, oh, wow, and he took off running. And I thought, you know, if I could create a piece of architecture that would produce that kind of response in a human being, I'd be very pleased with myself. Okay, so that structure, by the way, is high enough above the occupied surfaces that it uh, does not have to be fireproofed. Um, but most structures are not that tall, so we have to worry about fire exposure in the structures. And here's an example of how we can deal with that. In this case, the structural elements are concrete uh, precast hollow core planks, which are fire resistant, and then the structure sits on top of that. These are not your ordinary planks. They have extra thickened materials at the boundary to take these loads, and it may not, in fact, be that practical or economical to do this on a one-off basis. So if someone was going to uh, promote this as a roofing system, they would need to uh, get extruders uh, to produce a slightly different section. But here we have these hollow cores, which can be used as part of the ductwork system. In this case, the apertures are quite narrow, and you'll notice curved elements are incorporated here to deflect light downward, rather than have it pass through the roof monitor and just come out the other side. You'll also notice that the electric lights are integrated into the system so that they basically are coming from the same location as the daylight. So as the daylight comes up or goes down, the electric lights are, are producing basically the same pattern of light as the sunlight or the daylight in the space. Uh, it can be a little distracting if the light source from the electricity is here and the daylight is there and someone's reading a book and is, as the shift occurs from one light source to the other, the directionality of the light changes. We can also do a roofing system like this in steel. Here you see some steel trusses that have been moved slightly closer together 
and then this gray portion represents an encasing ceiling which could be used for fireproofing purposes um, but also just generally cleans up all the structure up above visually and allows the light to come into the space with the minimal number of surfaces on which it can be absorbed. We can also, uh, as opposed to using two trusses that are sort of close together, we can fold those trusses against each other on the bottom cord and produce this kind of triangular truss. And that has a very nice feature because sometimes this lower flat surface of ceiling is perceived to be fairly dark relative to those surfaces, although sloping these surfaces has helped greatly uh, as opposed to having, say, a vertical light well surface which absorbs a lot of light but is also excessively bright. So we've, we've started to solve that problem by sloping this surface and that surface but we still have this flat ceiling and we might want to go to something like this where we have no flat ceiling which produces the greatest sense of uniformity of light in the space and that's particularly important to avoid any sense of gloominess that might prompt people to turn the electric lights on but it's also really important in using computers because we'd like to have a fairly uniform luminous environment so we don't have highly varying patterns of light reflecting off of the surfaces of our computers. These uh, tubular trusses can also be made out of folded plates of some sort, um, although the truss system is probably uh, more economical. Um, this shows a, a series of trusses intersecting in a grid pattern. Um, this is perhaps not quite as desirable as the long linear trusses that are apertures that are facing primarily north and south. These now will be facing uh, both north, east, south, and west. Um, this is a little model of that kind of structure which uh, may give a somewhat different perspective on it or allow it to be more apparent what's happening. But we have bottom cord members all along here and here, but we have twice as many top cord members, which makes sense because the top cord members are in compression and are therefore vulnerable to buckling, but they also have localized loads on them that are inducing bending. So from a sort of balance point of view, this is a very desirable arrangement, having half as many bottom cords as top cords. Uh, it also allows this sort of coffered volume where this is the boundary in the ceiling and that's the boundary for the pop-up roof. Um, and this coffer allows light to spread out into the space uh, before it encounters any surfaces to absorb it. So this is a model of such a structure at a larger scale. You'll notice these blue ducts have been put in here to sort of indicate um, what's intended there. This structure is basically a grid, so ducts can be run in multiple directions. Uh, this is not necessarily ideal. Uh, the air circulation system in a building tends to be a sort of tree structure, not unlike the vascular system in the human body where you start with arteries which branch into smaller and smaller arteries. Um, in this case, um, this grid structure though does allow uh, running utilities in both directions. This is what that looks like with the coffered surfaces um, inserted up between the trusses. So you'll notice the light source is up here, but this coffer splays or opens up to allow the light to pass down. This is what that looks like in a sort of finished off form. These are actually cardboard models, but it looks quite realistic when photographed in this manner. This is what that model looks like on the outside. Uh, here it has one wall that's been removed to allow you to look into it, but when light measurements are made, that wall would be inserted in place also. Again, I note that these are equal amounts of northeast, south, and west, which turns out to be not too bad, particularly if you have some sort of shading element that can be shifted from east to west. So at any given time during a summertime, you're covering the portion of the glazing that's uh, facing into the summer beam sunlight. Okay, again, I want to point out, though, that apertures with 
long north and south exposures and lesser east and west exposures are generally favorable. But there are spaces which are so central in nature that some sort of omnidirectional glazing seems an appropriate psychological gesture towards the rest of the building, in which case these equal amounts of uh, north, south, east, and west glazing might be appropriate. Okay, so everything we've shown so far has structure beneath the aperture. Now we're going to show some examples of structure in the aperture. So this is one we looked at earlier. You'll notice up above we have these really deep trusses that are in the aperture. And it may look like there's a super deep beam underneath, but or heavy beam. But that beam is actually not deep enough to span the space. And so it's not really a beam. This is a deep truss. And this thick portion in here is really what's necessary to provide a place for water runoff to be conducted off to the sides of the building. So you see the truss in the aperture. Uh, some people might think that that's an, a visual obstruction, but it turns out to be a pretty minor blockage of light. And uh, it's an ideal place to put the structure so that the structure is not, not down below blocking basketballs. And it allows us to put in a really deep structure, which tends to make the structure more efficient. Here's another example. Uh, here we are looking at north and south glazing coming through the trusses. We have a lower roof, a higher roof, a lower roof, a higher roof, and so forth. And when we put the roof in place, it looks something like that. So this might be the south side, and then on the other side there's a north aperture, which we can't see in this particular view. In this case, I've shown uh, long expanses of parallel cord trusses supporting uh, sort of primary functional spaces, but to create a hierarchy in the building along this central spine, I've incorporated a somewhat different uh, triangular shape to the glazing to accentuate the importance of this central spine as part of the circulation system. Um, here's another view uh, in a three-dimensional rendering of that phenomenon. So here you see a bunch of uh, purlins or joists that are spanning across these spaces. If the spaces between the trusses are small enough, they can actually be spanned by decking, in which case these purlins become unnecessary. And that has a very nice effect. For example, if we look at this particular um, view, we have a deep truss in this case that's running the full vertical dimension of the light well and the aperture. And from the side that truss looks like this. So this is the aperture. This is the sloped roof in between which has to carry water off. And then there's a tapered volume for air. And what's really very pleasing about this is as you move in this direction, the volume for water runoff increases, which is the way you want it, because as you have more water accumulating, you want a deeper volume. Likewise, if this is the center of the building and air is being sent out into this tapered volume, uh, you want the most air delivered at, at this point, and then as it bleeds off into the space, the size of that volume varies as you go along. Uh, this is showing a situation where we have a 30 foot wide slope, then we might have that center spine, and then a 30 foot wide slope on the other side. We can go more than 30 feet, but that implies that this tapered roof has to have more vertical dimension to allow the water runoff to occur. And so that would look something like the, the following. So now this tapered runoff surface is occurring over a 60 foot span and the depth of the, of the curbing under the glazing has increased and the depth of the tapered volume for transport. So in essence, before we were looking just at a volume from there to there, now we're going an extra 60 feet. So we need more vertical dimension for that air. In this case, we've got a vertical dimension for these trusses. It's about six feet. We're spanning about 60 feet, which gives us a length to depth ratio of 10, which has nice deep proportions. And that becomes pretty crucial that we have a good stiff truss 
because we're going to have glass up in this aperture and if the truss deflects too much that glass uh, could crack or we could have excessive uh, wear and damage to the to the um, elements that are uh, waterproofing the glass. So that ends our um, video on coordinating structure, daylighting apertures, and ductwork in roofing systems.